Today we are very excited to be uh, down just off of the lobby in the State House under the East Staircase for our newest uh, permanent exhibit here at the State House. This is Women in the State House, um, and this is a continuing effort on our part to better recognize uh, groups who have been. Um, not as much in the forefront here as they should have been, uh, who have made great contributions uh, to this building and to the state as a whole. That started out last spring with our uh, Abnaki exhibits, and now we've uh, moved to the, the uh, in conjunction with the Centennial of Women's Suffrage, uh, the 19th Amendment, we've moved on here to this exhibit. And um, it's, it's a really great piece. We're very happy with how it came out. Uh, we've got three panels kind of going through the history of women's struggle for suffrage, and then the 100 years that they have spent here in the state House and their growing um, power as legislators here. So the first panel kind of looks at the history of suffrage in the state here in Vermont, in particular focusing on the work of Clarina Howard Nichols, who was the first woman to um, speak before the state legislature here in the House. Uh, we jump into some of the political pioneers, uh, female political pioneers here in the state, in particular Edna Beard, who was the first uh, woman legislator, the first in the House, and then two years later the first in the Senate, and then Consuela Northrop Bailey, who was the first uh, Speaker of the House, female Speaker of the House, and then went on to become actually Vermont's uh, first female lieutenant governor and just and the first elected female lieutenant governor in the United States as well. Um, there's a really interesting Life magazine article from the 50s here titled Ladies Taking Our Lady Vermont Ladies Are Taking Over. <coughs> it's a really interesting um, look at that period in time kind of around World War II where uh, women were jumping much more into the workforce and that also included into state legislatures, particularly here in Vermont. And then we've kind of jumped into the more modern period uh, in our Women Gain Power section here um, in, the, uh, in the 70s into the 80s up to 2000 when um, the percentage of women in the Vermont legislature uh, continued to grow dramatically. Uh, we've got a great graph on there that you can look at that, that shows just how much ahead of the curve percentage wise we were uh, versus the rest of the nation for pretty much the last hundred years, which is pretty neat. But this highlights things like Madeleine Cunin becoming Vermont's first woman governor, uh, our, our three uh, previous female um, speakers of the House, Barbara Snelling, uh, female lieutenant governor as well, and a few other firsts in there. Um, so there's a lot of informa interesting information to take a look at here. And then kind of one of the real showpieces of this display is this desk that's in the front here. <clears throat> and this desk is original to the State House. This is actually the desk, seats 145 and 146, that both Edna Beard and Consuela Bailey both sat in uh, when they were here in the State House. Uh, desk 146, which is the desk on the right, uh, is a desk that, that both um, Edna Beard and Consuela Bailey sat in. Um, <clears throat> again, Beard being the first woman to serve in the House here in Vermont in 1921 for a term. And then uh, decade, uh, basically a generation later, Consuela Bailey would pick this desk. And the really interesting um, piece of history about that is the plaque that's on there um, honoring Edna Beard was actually not, uh, was there when, when um, Bailey came into the, the house and had the chance to choose a desk, but she did not choose it for that reason. She actually chose it because this was the same desk that her father sat at in 1900 when he served a term in the legislature. And uh, unfortunately, the interior of the desks was sanded out when these were taken out of the, the house chamber uh, during reapportionment in the 60s and early 70s. But um, at the time, she could actually see her, her father's signature clear as day in the desk. So it was kind of one of those really um, interesting pieces of history that she chose this desk as another female trailblazer here in Vermont politics, but she chose it because of her father had had it, not necessarily because Edna Beard had had it. Uh, the other half of the desk we have turned into a little display case with lots of um, buttons and brochures and different uh, campaign materials from Vermont women as well. And uh, we're really excited to kick this exhibit off. It's got a lot of really interesting information and uh, I certainly would encourage folks as they pass through the building, give yourself at least five or ten minutes, take a good look at it. Lots of great information, lots of great images, uh, historical and contemporary, and we're going to be rotating the uh, ephemera that's in the case here probably every few weeks as well. So uh, come by and take a look at it. We're really, really pleased with how it came out and really excited to celebrate um, the last century of Vermont women here in the State House. Let me welcome everyone um, to the lobby of the State House for yet another historic occasion. Um, we're all about history in this building as well as 
the history that is made every day in this building and the history to come. And today we're, we're doing something rather important and that is to acknowledge that for oh roughly 180 years women have been very much a part of this building but they have not exactly been playing um, the same way that men have played in the state house and we're here to inaugurate a new exhibition in the main lobby that we hope tells that story truthfully tells the story of how women have attempted to be a part of this building long before the past 100 years when they actually have been part of the politics of this building and we're here to inaugurate that story we want you to spend a fair amount of time reading it looking at it appreciating it and then getting back to the state curator's office with any comments um, that it may uh, prompt. Um, and we have a wonderful little list of people who are going to help us celebrate today. And at the very top of that list, of course, is the governor himself, Phil Scott. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for having me. It's uh, great to be here for this dedication. You know, the State House is not only home of state government, but it's the People's House. And it has been a museum from the very start. That's important because the museums tell stories. And uh, the stories of this place, naturally, revolve around our people and our politics. However, an unfortunate part of this story is that throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, men took center stage in state government, making the decisions within this building and buildings like it across the state, or country, I should say. It was not until the 19th Amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution 100 years ago that finally gave women the right to vote and to enter the state as lawmakers. And make no mistake, this was a result of hard work and commitment of women across the state and country advocating day in and day out for, for women's suffrage. People like my grandmother, who lived on a farm in nearby Plainfield and was a proud and loyal member of the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Today, we celebrate the achievements of these advocates and female trailblazers across the state and in this state house. I want to thank those women who blazed the trail all those years ago to each of the legislators who carry that torch today. And I'm pleased to be surrounded by many of you this afternoon. It's fitting that we mark this occasion in the same week when we saw Katie Sowers make history when she became the first woman to coach in the Super Bowl. I heard her say that all it takes is one, and it opens the door to so many. And that's so true. And when I think about my two daughters, I want to thank all those women who have been the one who opened more opportunities for my girls and for all women. In the Vermont legislature, that one woman was Edna Beard, Vermont's first woman legislator. In the executive branch, it was Governor Madeline Cunin and Lieutenant Governor Consuela Bailey. And in our highest court, it was Denise Johnson, Vermont's first female Supreme Court Justice. And while it takes just one to open the door, it takes many to widen them. So again, I want to thank the Speaker, Majority Leaders Ballant and Krowinski, Minority Leader McCoy, Dean of the House, my friend, Representative Emmons, and so many others serving with them today and who served in the past for showing young girls around the state what they can achieve. Every one of you is helping to move the, me the needle to bring more gender parity to the State House and to our work, so I thank you for that. Because we've come a long ways in 100 years, but not far enough yet. 
In closing, I want to acknowledge the many people who contributed to this project, including David Sheets and the Curator's Office, Friends of the State House, the Historical Society, the State Ar Archives and Records Administration, and so many more. This is an important issue to celebrate, and again, I thank you all for being here today. And now, Vermont's third woman Speaker of the House, Mitzi Johnson. I am incredibly proud of the title, Madam Speaker. <laughs> About two weeks ago, um, because of changes in two other states, we hit a historic high of the number of Madam Speakers in state houses across the country. Think to yourself, don't clap just yet. How many is that? Eight. Good job, sir. Thank you for noting. Eight, eight out of 50 is the high that we are celebrating. I'm not okay celebrating 16%. And while it takes that one woman to be the first, it takes systemic changes so that others can follow. On the House floor today, we uh, clarified campaign law so that, so that you could use campaign expenditures for child and dependent care. Vermont is the last state in the country that has never sent a woman to Washington. And when we, when we look at um, members of Congress and the U.S. Senate, the vast majority of them started in politics before they were 35. Which means we need to make sure that women in their teens and 20s and early 30s have the support they need from their community, from their partners, from their employer to both take care of the family that they share, many of them with men, and also take care of the world around them by running for office, by being leaders in the business sector, by becoming members of the Supreme Court. I am thrilled to celebrate the women that have gotten us here. I am thrilled to own this title of Madam Speaker at this point in history. And we need to all work together on the systemic changes necessary for true equality. Because if 100 years gets us to 16%, we gotta pick up the pace, folks. <laughs> for the Senate, the President Pro Tem, Tim Ash. Well, thank you, David, and I think um, it's a really powerful, just like when we created um, the uh, exhibit about Abenaki, which is just off to that corner, which was really the first time this building acknowledged people who were here long before people came to settle from Europe and other parts of the world. What we start with today, and this is really a starting point, is a rather modest but important first recognition of the influence that women have had in this building. And I think it's just in the last two days we've had hundreds of students from across the state walking through the hallways. If they were walking through almost any corridor here, they would see just two or three portraits of women on the, on the walls here. I think we all know that to be true. And yet, one of the strange things is that this building this building is not meant to be a building of governor's portraits and lieutenant governor's portraits. This is actually the legislature's building first and foremost. 
And I just want to briefly acknowledge the particularly outsized role women have been playing in the legislature. Now, when I first got to the Senate, we, we have what we call the money committees. So in the House, it's Ways and Means and Appropriations. In the Senate, it's Finance and Appropriations. These are called the money committees. When I arrived, all four committees were chaired by women. So four most important positions, really, in the legislature, all chaired by women. I then became the chair of finance, so I kind of became the male auxiliary of the <laughs> women of money. But then I was removed from that position, so we're back to four women who chair the most important committees in the legislature. And I think, though, that beyond that, House and Senate committee chairs for decades now have been uh, ably filled by women leaders. We do not see their pictures on the wall. And I know I see uh, the chair of our institutions committee, which is in uh, charge of capital uh, activities, uh, Joe Benning, and he is interested in making sure that next year when we see hundreds of kids coming through here, they're seeing women representation on the walls, not just the men who uh, have the white starch collars from the 1800s. So I just want to say uh, briefly what a privilege it has been to serve alongside so many very powerful, talented women in my role in the Senate. Right now, uh, it's a lot easier when you only have 30 to do uh, a quick uh, a, a list of them, but Senators Jane Kitchell, Ann Cummings, Jeanette White, Ginny Lyons, Alice Nicka, Becca Ballin, Debbie Ingram, Allison Clarkson, Ruth Hardy, and Cheryl Hooker are all women senators uh, who do such a fantastic job here, and I think that we do need to change the way this building looks so that, looking back, people will see their faces on the walls, not just those uh, guys from the 1800s. Thank you. I started my tenure as curator back in the 80s when Madeleine Cunin was Vermont's first governor. I vividly remember that long after uh, Madeleine left this building, in 1993, the State House did something even more monumental and unthinkable at the time. Teresa Randall was elected as the first female sergeant at arms. And I still remember that there were a lot of guys in the building who had trouble with that. They could accept a governor that was a woman, but the sergeant at arms? And happily now, we're on to our second, and that's Janet Miller. <laughs> So much. Um, I just would like to reiterate uh, the opportunity to recognize Teresa Randall. Uh, she was the Sergeant at Arms from 1993 to 1996, and Teresa worked for uh, Governor Coonan. And in 1993, it was very rare for a woman to be a Sergeant at Arms. I think maybe there was one other, but not very many. So the Vermont Legislature again showed their confidence in a woman and elected Teresa to that position. Uh, Teresa passed away last year, and she was a mentor to me, so we had a lot of conversations of how things have changed, but sometimes things still stay the same. And I think there's still some element of surprise when someone comes up to me and says, uh, is the sergeant at arms here? And I say, well, we're talking to her, so it's a, it's a bit of a surprise, but I think people are getting used to it. There are still maybe less than 10, I'm not sure, sergeant at arms throughout the uh, country, so it's a privilege to have that honor. Um, I'd like to just say, for 25 years later, 2020, there are many women in the Vermont State House, not only our legislators, but we have administrative staff, committee staff, attorneys, fiscal analysts, staff, um, police officers, doorkeepers, tour guides, janitorial and cafeteria management, lobbyists, and media personnel. Those were all roles held by men previously. And now our eighth grade pages, who by the way, were all boys until about 1973, 72, early 70s, I think it would be very strange for them to be here when there weren't any women. So I'd also like to thank all of you, and I don't want to forget the men who support the women here at the Vermont State House. I think that's an important thing because we're in a lucky place to be. So thank you.
Our last speaker is one that we wanted to reflect on the long picture here at the State House, the long view. And so naturally, we turn to the Dean of the House, Representative Alice Emmons. hard time figuring out what I was going to say but let me just start by saying I was first elected back in 1982 I was 27 years old and I thought I'd start out by giving a little bit of statistics in terms of where the women were back in 1983 and 84 that was my freshman year in this building I was a pretty young person and at that time, in the Senate, there were four women senators. In the House, there were 30 women in the House. Of the 30, 10 came in with me. So in 1983 is when we started seeing the trajectory of going up. At that time, we only had in the House about three chairs that were women. To this day, we have over half of our committees that are chaired by women. The other thing I looked at, too, was the division between the two parties for the women, and they were pretty evenly split. There were 14 Democratic women and 16 Republican women. So in context, in looking at that, we have grown, but we have a tremendous way to go. We also had a women's caucus back then, and our first priority in the women's caucus was a law for, for child seats, a requirement that our children be in a car seat and not just strapped in with a seat belt. And I remember that was our, one of our first debates on the floor of the House, and that was pretty split in terms of gender in that the men did not want to have to put a car seat in the front seat of their pickup truck to drive around the farm. That was the, le that was the debate at that point. So here we are 20 years later, and we have 10 women senators and, a, and 62 women house members. So we, we're getting there. So the other thing I noticed in terms of a woman governor, I was here when Madeline was elected, and the thing that struck me the most was Inauguration Day. It was a very soothing and meaning, meaningful day. The Vermont Symphony was here playing, and it was just a very calm and joyful day. The inaugurations for a man governor are very, very different. And I didn't realize that until after Madeline was no longer governor. There were brass bands, there were military. It was a very, very different feel. And that's how it has changed over time. Because even now with a male governor, it's a softer tone, which I think we bring to the table. And the last that I'll say, this is a little strange. <laughs> it's a little strange, but it shows the impact that we had back in the late 80s. We built an addition to the State House. And one of the major pieces of discussion was how many bathrooms for women because we didn't have enough. And that was a large discussion when we did the expansion. And the other part that was really important to that were changing tables. We did not have changing tables in the State House. And we very seldom even had legislators that could bring in their children. And now that has all changed. So we've made progress. Thank you, and we have more to do. Thank you.
in, in wrapping up, I want to thank a few people who made our exhibition possible. At the very top of that list is the assistant state curator, who I am so proud is among the foremost women's historians in Vermont, Jack Zylenga. Jack would be the first to thank the four women historians who helped us substantially with our story telling in the exhibit. Amy Morsland, is Amy here? From Middlebury College. Um, uh, uh, Melanie Gustafson from UVM, is Melanie here? Uh, Marilyn Blackwell, um, the favorite historian here in Central Vermont. <laughs> yes, Karen Madden at uh, Northern Vermont University. Those four women, Jack was in regular communication with them throughout this process. And we've been working on this for a year and a half, um, at least. And in that process, we have been very substantially assisted by the Curatorial Task Force, chaired by Mary Leahy. Mary? Is right over there. And I see quite a few members of our task force. They are the people who are working avidly with us starting with the Abenaki display on the other side of the lobby to connect all Vermonters to their state house. That is our mission. We have all kinds of strategies for accomplishing that, but these exhibitions are a direct result of the work that we've done with Mary's commission. And we'll be continuing to work with them on that mission in the months and years to come, perhaps. <clears throat> Finally, the Friends of the State House. Um, they have worked with me for 40 years here at the State House to restore the building and to begin the process of acknowledging that this building is a museum and that consequently it has audiences and we need to address those audiences. You heard Tim about the school kids. We get more school children than any other site by far in Vermont. And we take our mission to teach them about not only Vermont history, but civics and what is going on in this building. That is very much a part of our mission to make sure that they understand government, understand history and its place in their lives. To go forth to be citizens of Vermont. That's huge. And we are very grateful to the friends for helping us with that mission and for throwing great parties. <laughs> so in, down that hallway is a wonderful reception that we want you to enjoy. We have also partnered with the Humanities Council who are at the table over here. We're presenting tonight's Farmers Night which where we sing the 19th Amendment to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights uh, with a wonderful assortment of singers, many of them legislators and people here in the State House. And we have Meg Mott. Is Meg here? Meg Mott is a scholar from Marlboro College, another historian, an authority on the 19th Amendment, and Meg is going to engage the Farmers' Night audience in an examination of that pivotal moment when women got the right to vote. And finally, over here, the Alliance, the Vermont Suffrage Centennial Alliance is the organization that you need to be aware of throughout the year. This is just the beginning of a whole year's worth of events that the Alliance is in, on top of, visit their website, uh, the Vermont Suffrage Centennial Alliance, and you will see event after event 
culminating in the August 22nd observance of the actual centennial when it was ratified by, I'm sorry to say, Tennessee. the state of Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, it could have been Vermont, but it wasn't. <clears throat> You'll find out why when you examine our exhibit. And so many wonderful stories are over there, so please spend some time with the exhibit reading about the desk that is on display that both Edna Beard and Consuelo Bailey shared and how they used that desk. Um, we're very grateful to the Vermont Historical Society for making that available to us for the exhibition. Anyway, from now on, let's celebrate women, let's celebrate the empowerment of women right here in this building, and let's party on. Thank you. Hi, I'm Senator Randy Brock. I represent Franklin County and Alberg in, in the Senate. Uh, I'd like to talk about two things today, and uh, they all relate to spending. You know, we uh, are always talking about how we save money, how we improve the economy, how we do all of those things that are really so important to Vermonters. But one of the things that we never seem to talk about is how much we're spending. We talk about how to uh, fund programs, we talk about moving money around, we talk about creative ways to get more money and more revenue coming in, uh, and we also talk sometimes about how we lower the cost of things to Vermonters, but we never talk about lowering our spending. And we've got two bills right now that are pending. One of them is the minimum wage and the other is paid family leave, which of course was just vetoed by the governor. Minimum wage is, is, is a great idea in terms of we all want to increase the amount of income uh, to uh, people at the lower end of the scale. And our minimum wage is, of course, considerably higher than it is in, in neighboring New Hampshire, and is scheduled to go even higher without a forced minimum wage increase. But we never talk about who's going to pay for that minimum wage increase particularly in a state uh, that will require, with a minimum wage increase that, that is on the agenda right now, something like uh, $121 million by 2022. Where's that going to come from? Well, the answer is it's going to come from increased taxes, and it's going to come from increased costs for goods and services in Vermont. And in the second oldest state in the country, where we have a large population of seniors, they're not going to get a dime from a minimum wage increase on paid family leave. We all know that it's a great idea to have the ability to bond with newborns, to uh, uh, be able to provide for uh, coverage for when we're ill or when a close relative is ill, and that, that's a great idea. But at the same time, a force program that deals with a mandatory payroll tax that will cost $29 million in the next year, again, the question comes, where's that going to come from? Well, it's going to come from the wages of Vermonters uh, who will see a payroll tax increase. And that's particularly significant to the thousands of Vermonters who are part-time workers or low-income workers who are not going to be able to even collect a benefit, even though they're going to have to pay into the system. The governor proposed, and I introduced in the Senate, a voluntary paid leave plan that will allow people to uh, join uh, the same plan that our state employees will have, that creates a group large enough to be able to get reasonably low rates. And that kind of plan, uh, I believe, is what Vermonters need so that people who want paid family leave can have it, and can have it at an affordable price. The governor supported the bill that passed, which I think was fatally flawed, and I support uh, his veto. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Senator Alice Nitka. I live in Ludlow and represent the so-called Windsor District, which consists of all the towns in Windsor County, and also Mount Holly in Rutland County, and Londonderry in Wyndham County. It's interesting here today, I just came through the Cedar Creek Room, which is where, you know, many receptions are held, press conferences, and you'll see the you know, sometimes in the background you can frequently see the pictures of um, activities, things that happened in the Vermont Civil War. Also where the, I think it's the largest painting in the state, is done by Julian Scott um, after the Civil War. He went into the Civil War, it's an interesting little piece if you don't know this already from visiting here. A uh, young fellow, age 14, went in, Julian Scott went into the uh, Civil War with his father and Julian was the drummer boy and he, 
after he was wounded some, at some point during the Civil War, but he, just another interesting piece, he was the first Medal of Honor winner, which is not everybody knows that this is a great honor that he received. And also, he, um, after he was wounded and got out of the war, he went to art school in New York City. He was originally from Johnson, Vermont. Went to art school, came back to Vermont, and painted many Civil War. He probably did them in New York, some of them in New York, but came back here and painted some incredible paintings of the Vermont brigades in the Civil War. And the, we have two of those here. One is the very large painting and interesting in the annals of the State House, you can look, we've looked up, um, our curator did, not, not myself, um, when the leg he came to the legislature seeking money for the frame to go around the painting that he did, which is very large, as I said, it's taking up one wall in the Cedar Creek room, and he, uh, the legislature in all of its wisdom, <laughs> gave him the money for half of the frame. They did not give it to him for the whole thing. He had to come back another year and get the, the f money for the frame of the, for the frame for the other side, for the other half. So nice little history here. But I've just come through there, that's why I'm getting on a tangent here. I walked through there and there's a press conference happening there now with um, our Attorney General T.J. Donovan and some of the Abnaki people from our state. And there's a bill, I'm in the Senate, but in the House there is a bill that's been put in by two members with regard to giving uh, free hunting and fishing licenses to the Abnaki and probably other indigenous peoples as well. So I don't know all the details of that bill, but you might want to look that up and see what that says. Um, they said, well, vet some veterans groups get them. I, I have to look up some of these things and see exactly who does get the free license, some disabled people, people and so anyway, that's a bill that's proposed, so they're doing a press conference in that room, um, just finishing as we speak here. Um, in my committees, on which I serve, appropriations and judiciary, uh, a lot of things are going on with regard to, we just passed the budget adjustment and appropriations, and that's basically the true up between the budget that we passed last year and na six months later now when um, money that's been spent maybe not all of it was spent so now we can maybe use that money in another area and money that needs needed to be spent for you know we have to still go through um, June 30th so there's money that's needed in some other areas that wasn't anticipated you can always think of something like and this of course did not happen this year thank goodness but when Irene happened there had to be a very large budget adjustment for you know to take care of all the needs of everything that was damaged during Irene and of course it certainly didn't take care of everything it's impossible uh, in my committee my other committee judiciary we're working on something called justice reinvestment this has been going on for quite a while there was another round of it several years ago to um, help corrections reduce the cost um, so there's been a lot of work done to have you know, we have a number of prisoners out of state to bring prisoners back to Vermont and, and also to have the space to house them here. And, you know, there's a lot of um, communities who sign up to have a prison in their town sometimes have stipulations on who can be served there and housed there. So that's the case with St. Johnsbury. There was a memorandum of understanding as to what can type of prisoner with whoever, you know, different types of crimes that they did not want housed at St. Johnsbury. It, a portion of the prison is a work camp whereby um, persons are there who are able to go out into the community and work and go back into the prison. Work camps have been very successful, um, so successful that we don't have enough prisoners who are eligible to be in a work camp to fully, um, you know, take all the beds that are there. So St. Johnsbury has some restrictions as to who can be in their total prison, including um, sex offenders. So sex offenders are some of the most difficult people, even though many have reached their minimum sentence when they would be normally able to be let out on probation or parole or whatever they're out on furlough, whatever the situation might be. Um, and it's very hard to find housing for um, persons who have, been, who have been convicted of a sex offense. 
So right now, I think there, I think I heard the other day there were, uh, I don't know, 61 maybe, who are eligible for release into the community, but there's no appropriate housing for them. So this is a real dilemma. Um, you know, it's, it's very scary for some people, and these are people who need supervision, which of course would happen. Um, you know, if they're just if they're getting out on parole, for instance. So anyway, that's one of the things that um, Justice Reinvestment is looking at, trying to reduce the number of prisoners, at the same time, you know, keep the community safe and provide adequate programming for these prisoners. For instance, domestic violence programming. Um, you know, many ask education in some cases. So anyway, that's what's being looked at, and it's uh, keeping our our community in safe as well as um, doing rehabilitation for certain prisoners is um, what's happening there. Uh, there's an interesting new, new display in the State House on the main floor in the lobby and it just was uh, placed there yesterday by David Sheets, our curator, with regard to women's suffrage. And it turns out there's, uh, you can come in and see it and see, you know, some of the history makers in Vermont who were women and what, what's gone on through the years. But also tonight, uh, today is February 5th, and for Farmers' Night, which happens every Wednesday night, basically, during the session, um, there's some entertainment. And tonight there's a program on women's suffrage, and some of the uh, members of the House are doing some of the singing at the program. There are some incredibly talented people in this body that have all kinds of talents. And it's, it sounds like it's going to be a very interesting program. It's all open to the public. It takes place in the well of the house. And uh, some of the events, a lot of musical events, are very well attended. Others I don't think people know about, so they don't come in. But if, if you're ever here on a Wednesday, at see what's going on. You can look online, too, and find out and maybe stop in. That st starts at 7.30 on Wednesdays. So, thank you very much. Hi, I'm State Senator Dick McCormick representing the Windsor County District and uh, we're in I think week five of the legislature. I spoke to you last during the first week. Uh, since then I, I serve on the Appropriations Committee in the afternoon and the Health and Welfare Committee in the morning. Uh, since I last spoke to you, uh, the Appropriations Committee has passed out the Budget Adjustment Act and <clears throat> reported on the Senate floor by our Chair Jane Kitchell, who has a capacity for details that just leaves the rest of us in the dust. And uh, anyway, that, and that has passed. So we have made the necessary adjustments on the uh, 2020 budget uh, midway. The, we went into the fiscal year on the 1st of July uh, 2019, and we'll complete that year at uh, 31st of June. And uh, so now we're getting started uh, developing the 2021, fiscal year 2021 budget. And um, part of that is that each member of the Appropriations Committee is, well, the whole committee is responsible for the whole budget, but then each member is responsible for particular parts of the budget. And uh, we interview the appropriate bureaucrats and get a better sense of, of exactly how uh, this or that department works. Um, I deal with K through 12 education and I deal with um, uh, general government, which is to say the governor's office, the um, lieutenant governor's office, and then various other agencies, um, a lottery, for example, economic development. Um, and and we're, I'm just getting started on that. In health and welfare, one thing we've been dealing with is uh, flavored vaping and flavored cigarettes, uh, the controversy being menthol. And uh, we've taken some pretty disturbing testimony <clears throat> that menthol, if you think about it, uh, when you have a cold, you take a menthol cough drop, and the reason is it numbs your throat. <laughs> And it uh, and and so too menthol tobacco numbs your throat so that you can breathe it in deeper. You can do even more harm to your lungs without it being irritating. And um, we're probably I think we're going to pass a bill 
that just outlaws menthol. We're already outlawed uh, other flavors that are aimed at kids. Uh, and and uh, we're going to add menthol to that. That has been the exception. Um, I'm not entirely comfortable with that. I'm wondering, I mean, here we are backing off on, on marijuana, which is not necessarily, marijuana is not necessarily a good thing. I've said this before. It results in bad poetry and makes rock musicians think they're better than they are. It makes my friends uh, who smoke a lot of pot um, boring, people I otherwise like. <laughs> makes them tedious. So pot is not a good thing, but my conclusion has always been that uh, the laws against pot are worse than the pot. And I, I, I see myself somewhat in, in, uh, contradicting myself by taking that position on cannabis and then on the other hand cracking down on the uh, menthol uh, tobacco products. But I think the, the main difference is that tobacco really is fiercely addictive. I think marijuana is habituating and the difference between a habit and an addiction may be a, a, a distinction without a difference. Um, there, I, I know of people who really don't function well without marijuana. Uh, but I think um, the real fierce addiction of cigarettes uh, is such that that that's that's the difference. That's where and, and menthol is part of the addicting process. I'm going to be reporting a bill that um, I'm dreading going on the Senate floor because generally any legislation that it, that has to deal with um, body functions is is an awkward topic for public discussion. But there is something called irritable bowel syndrome, and that one of the symptoms, and there are various uh, forms of that. There are various illnesses, Crohn's disease, and so on. Uh, there are various. Um, uh, conditions that can result in a person absolutely needing, non-negotiably needing to use the bathroom immediately. And this uh, bill would say that, that if a business dealing with the public has an employee restroom and there are a couple of people in there so you're not letting someone into the back room who might get into your files or steal from your stock, that, that a, a person who can verify that they have an irritable bowel syndrome, that they, they can go to the bathroom. And um, it seems reasonable to me. Uh, again, no one likes the government ever telling anybody that they have to do something. And certainly an owner of his own business may say, why is the government telling me this? And it's, it's just a matter of compassion. Uh, probably those of us who don't have an ongoing irritable bowel syndrome, nevertheless, uh, have had episodes. We've all had episodes where it's non-negotiable. You must use a bathroom now. And to have someone, oh, well, our bathroom's not for public use, just strikes me as cruel and unnecessarily cruel. So <laughs> that's actually what I'm doing today is getting, getting ready on that bill. But mainly what we're dealing with is the budget and we're dealing with the issue and of, course of overriding the governor on um, uh, family leave and uh, probably by the time people see this that will have already um, been resolved. Uh, there is some question as to what the House is going to do. Um, so that's an ongoing issue and the overarching issue always is global warming. Well, I think that's about it for this time. Thank you for listening. Bye.